with the International Society for Biblical Hermeneutics, and this is our first session on our webinar on creationism. I'm here with Paul Garner. Uh, Paul is a full-time researcher and lecturer for Biblical Creation Trust. He has an MSc in Geoscience from University College London, where he specializes in paleobiology. He is a fellow of the Geological Society of London and a member of several other scientific societies. His first book, The New Creationism, Building Scientific Theories on Biblical Foundation, was published by Evangelical Press in 2009. You can see the Biblical Creation Trust at www.biblicalcreationtrust.org. Paul, thank you much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, happy Easter, everybody. Um, uh, it's really a privilege to be here and to be able to open this uh, webinar uh, for, for ISBH. Um, I apologize at the beginning. I've, I'm sort of on the tail end of a, a bug and it's left me with a bit of a dry cough at times. So if I, if I need to just pause, I have got some water to hand. So, uh, so, uh, j just if I, if I get coughing, you'll know why. Um, okay. Shall we screen share and we'll get started. Let's do that. <clears throat> All righty. There we go. That looked good. Looks great. Take it away. Appreciate it. Okay, let's go. Well, my talk today, as you can see, is about creation, evolution, and the scientific evidence. But of course, as, as creationists, um, we always want to begin with the Bible. We're creationists first and foremost, of course, because that's what the Bible teaches. And the Bible gives us an outline of uh, the early history of the earth that includes creation in six days, uh, the special creation of Adam and Eve, Adam's fall into sin, which brought death into the world, a worldwide flood in the days of Noah, and so on. And the difficulty that we face as creationists is that this outline of early Earth history is incompatible with the conventional evolutionary perspective at multiple points. And obviously that raises in people's minds all kinds of scientific questions, uh, not least what we're meant to do with the mountains of uh, evidence which are said to support evolution and a great age for the earth. And so that's what I want us to think about in this talk. How should we approach the scientific evidence? And the first thing I want to say is that we shouldn't be quick to dismiss the evidence for evolution and an old earth. Uh, there's a great deal of evidence that is said to uh, support these uh, ideas, and it comes from many different disciplines which appear to interlock and confirm one another. Uh, if you want to read about that evidence, you can obviously find it summarized in any uh, good textbook which deals with the topic of evolution and the age of the earth. But I've sort of summarized in this diagram a few uh, of these various sort of aspects of the evidence, for example, the similarities or the homologies that we observe between living organisms, and especially how those similarities are distributed, which is said to provide compelling evidence for universal common descent. Um, likewise, evolution is said to be supported by the intermediate forms or the transitional forms that we find in the fossil record, uh, by the order in which the major fossil groups make their first appearances, uh, by the biogeographic distribution of species across the surface of the earth, by observations of mutation and selection in modern populations, and, and many other things besides. And all of these different bits of evidence are said to be mutually supportive to converge on evolution as the best explanation. And in fact, it was part of uh, Darwin's intellectual genius, if you like, that he was apparently able to explain so many disparate ob observations with one very simple and compelling idea. So I think we would be um, foolish to just dismiss evolutionary theory without at least very careful thought and consideration. However, um, and, and this is a point which I think is sometimes hard for people um, to grasp, particularly if they're unfamiliar with the history or the philosophy of science, 
we have to remember that because a theory is uh, simple, compelling, appears to be supported by a great deal of data, that does not necessarily mean that it's true, that it's actually correct. Uh, in fact, the history of science is littered with elegant, compelling ideas that appeared to explain a, a wide range of data, but which turned out to be incorrect. And perhaps one of the um, best examples is geocentrism, uh, the idea that the Earth is fixed and immovable at the centre of our solar system, that the sun and the other planets uh, revolve around the Earth. Now, geocentrism was accepted by thinking people across the Western world for perhaps 1,500 years. In fact, you could say in terms of longevity, geocentrism may be the most successful theory in the entire history of science. And one of the reasons that geocentrism was dominant for so long was that the observational evidence seemed to strongly support it. You, you only had to look upwards to the heavens to see that all of the objects there, the sun and the other planets, revolved around the Earth. Geocentrism appeared to be self-evidently true. Of course, it also happened to be wrong. Uh, eventually, of course, it was displaced by the heliocentric system or, or a sun-centered system of the solar system, the kind of system championed by Copernicus and Galileo and others. But even then, um, that heliocentric system really only won out after maybe 150 years of intellectual struggle and debate. So I think um, one of the lessons we can learn from this is that it's a mistake to automatically assume uh, that the science is always correct. Uh, and so the question we need to ask ourselves is, what should we do as Christians today when we're faced with a scientific theory, such as the theory of evolution, that seems to run counter to the Bible? And I want to suggest a few um, guiding principles here. <clears throat> First of all, uh, of course, we can sometimes get our biblical interpretations wrong. There are occasions when extra biblical evidence can legitimately make us look again at what the scriptures really say. And perhaps geocentrism is a case in point there. But I think a problem arises when science is allowed to control our biblical interpretation. For example, if we come to the Bible already absolutely convinced that human beings came about by an evolutionary process that involved millions of years of physical death, then logically, when we read the text of Scripture, it cannot mean that physical death came about through Adam's sin, no matter what the text actually says. If this is our starting point as we come to read the Scriptures, we would have to read the biblical text in a way that's compatible with millions of years of pre-human death. But that's not really interpretation. Uh, that's allowing something from outside the Bible that we bring to the Scriptures to then dictate our interpretation, regardless of what the text actually says. So that's the first thing. We shouldn't let science control our interpretation. But that leads me to the second point. We have to be prepared to allow the Bible to challenge our scientific interpretations when that's necessary. If sound exegesis leads us to conclude that the Bible really does teach that physical death came about through Adam's sin, that there really was a recently created historical Adam from whom we're all descended, and a worldwide flood within recent human history, then we have to allow the Bible to push back against scientific interpretations that exclude these things. In other words, we, we mustn't be in the position of adopting a kind of hermeneutical ratchet where science can challenge our interpretation of Scripture, but Scripture is never allowed to challenge our interpretation of the scientific data. We have to allow the Bible to push back when necessary. Now, of course, um, when we do challenge the scientific consensus, I recognize that we are introducing some vulnerability. We're making a very bold claim. We're saying that the scientific consensus must be incorrect. And that's no small thing. 
So I do understand the desire of many Christians to avoid that kind of confrontation. I, I think that instinct is understandable. And it explains, I think, why so many Christians find themselves adopting a position on origins that they feel insulates them from scientific challenge. There are, however, I think a number of problems with this approach, not least that if what we say as Christians can never be tested by the evidence, then I don't think we should be surprised when people dismiss what we have to say without evidence, if they dismiss what we say as simply irrelevant. It's precisely because what we say is open to being confirmed or disconfirmed by the evidence that what we say is worth listening to. And surely here we have a biblical precedent. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14, if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain. Uh, notice that Paul here doesn't try to avoid a potential conflict with the evidence by saying, you know, well, of course, if, if Christ's body was found lying in a tomb somewhere, well, then we'll just reinterpret our theology to allow for some kind of less literal resurrection. No, the fact is that the Apostle Paul thought that certain conclusions were simply incompatible with Christianity, that if Christ was not raised, then Christianity was not true. And it's precisely that kind of vulnerability that I think makes the Christian message so compelling. And I think we should have the same confidence when we uh, come to other well-established biblical teachings, such as the biblical teaching concerning origins. Uh, here's a, a parallel example from the discipline of archaeology that may help to sort of reinforce this point. Um, over the years, a number of archaeologists have claimed that the biblical King David never existed. Uh, in their view, the archaeological evidence was simply against his historical existence. So how did evangelicals handle this apparent conflict between the Bible and the physical evidence? Well, what most of them didn't do was to simply give in and reinterpret the Bible to say that David wasn't really historical. Uh, to their credit, most of them did not resort to that terrible cliché it's the theology that matters, not the history. Uh, instead, they recognized that Christian theology is history, that it's rooted in history, and that when the history is thrown out, then uh, the theology likewise uh, is thrown out. So they maintained that the historicity of King David really mattered, uh, that the reliability and the truthfulness of the scriptures was at stake. And so they committed themselves to asking probing questions, to holding out for more evidence to come to light. And of course, in 1993, some of you will know this, uh, during excavations at Tel Dan in northern Israel, an inscription was uncovered that referred to the House of David, the first archaeological evidence of its kind, providing evidence of the historicity of King David. And so our evangelical belief in the Bible was vindicated. And I think uh, that we should approach the hard questions concerning origins in much the same way. When we're confronted uh, with an apparent conflict between the Bible and, let's say, geology or biology or astronomy, let's ask the hard questions. Let's apply ourselves to searching diligently for new data, for new interpretations of the evidence. And let's be willing to wait patiently for the new discoveries that will inevitably come. Now, of course, uh, some will say that evolution is simply a different case altogether. Uh, they'll say that evolution is so well supported that it's simply impossible to even conceive of an alternative theory. Uh, if I'm honest, um, I find that kind of thinking rather lazy and unscientific. How will we ever know whether a better theory can be found unless we're willing to diligently look for one? 
Every scientific theory that ended up in the dustbin of history was once thought to be the best way, perhaps the only way, to interpret the scientific evidence. But these theories were ultimately discarded because somebody thought that it was worth investigating an alternative. Still others may say, um, haven't we already been there and done that? Um, surely creationism has been tried before and it didn't work. It's nothing more than a failed idea from the past. But again, I, I think that view is somewhat mistaken. That The fact is that creationism has never been seriously tried, at least as a professional, multidisciplinary and research-based enterprise, until quite recently. Um, serious scientific research from a young age creationist perspective is actually rather new. And I think today we have many reasons to be encouraged as creationists because there's now a growing community of scientists across the world who are dedicated to building scientific models consistent with both the scientific data and the Bible's account of creation and the flood. Now, of course, we shouldn't underestimate the magnitude of this task. Reconstructing Earth history in this way is an enormous undertaking. It, it's a project that has really hardly begun, but we are beginning to make some progress. And the people who are doing this kind of scientific work are not amateurs. Uh, they're biologists and geologists, paleontologists and astronomers and people from many other disciplines. They have PhDs from reputable universities, PhDs in relevant scientific disciplines. Uh, take, for example, uh, Dr. Kurt Wise, who gained his PhD in paleontology from Harvard University, studying under the world famous evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould. Or, or take Dr. Todd Wood, a friend of mine, biochemist, who gained his PhD at the University of Virginia before serving as Director of Bioinformatics at the Clemson University Genomics Institute, and who today heads up a small ministry supporting creationist education and research in Tennessee. Now, in drawing attention to these scientists, my point is not to argue from authority or to try to impress you with their credentials, because compared to the evolutionary community, we are still a tiny and uh, in many ways despised minority. Uh, the point I simply want to make is that the creationists who are doing this kind of research are not ignorant know-nothings. They're people who have first-hand familiarity with the scientific data, people who understand how data is collected, how it's analyzed and how it's interpreted. And they're convinced that interpretations of the data other than biological evolution and deep time, are worth exploring. So we need to take these scientists seriously, I think, even if we disagree with them. And, and what's more, um, these creation scientists are getting their hands dirty doing real science. Uh, they're going out into the field, they're working in the lab, they're collecting and analysing data, publishing their findings. Uh, one particular focus of creationist research has been the geology of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Uh, the book that you can see here was published 30 years ago now and describes the creationist research that had been done on the canyon and its rock layers up to that time. And much more research has been done in Grand Canyon by creationists since then. It's been encouraging um, to see over the years creationists working together on multidisciplinary projects, something that's really important if we're going to make uh, progress in our understanding of Earth history. Um, nobody can be an expert in everything. And so we need people from different disciplines working together to solve the hard problems. Uh, one example of this kind of collaborative effort was the rate project. Uh, RATE was a, a project which investigated radioisotope dating and the age of the Earth from a creationist perspective. And today, um, creationists even have their own professional societies. There's the Creation Biology Society and the Creation Geology Society for those with advanced degrees in those disciplines. 
and whose annual conference, along with the Creation Theology Society, uh, provides an important forum for the presentation of new research. Uh, there's also the International Conference on Creationism. Uh, the ninth ICC was held just last year. Uh, it's held every four or five years or so. And that provides another really important forum for creationist peer review and for the presentation of creationist research. Another thing that often surprises people is how much of this creationist research gets published in secular journals or presented at secular scientific meetings. Uh, creationists who publish in these forums may not always be explicit about their creationist convictions for obvious reasons, um, but nevertheless, they're able to present research in these forums that was motivated by and inspired by their creationist concerns and interests. Uh, one example is the work that Dr. Leonard Brand and his colleagues have done on a graveyard of fossil whales in Peru. Uh, these researchers have documented hundreds of fossil whales buried in a kind of sediment called diatomite that today forms very slowly. However, the remarkable preservation of these fossil whales shows that the sediment must have built up much faster in the past than inferred from modern day rates. And their work, as you can see here, even made the front cover of Geology, uh, one of the leading journals in the discipline published by the Geological Society of America. Creationists also present their work at mainstream scientific conferences. Uh, for example, much of the work on the Coconino Sandstone of Grand Canyon, led by Dr. John Whitmore, which I was also privileged to take part in, was presented in various forms at annual meetings of the Geological Society of America. Uh, creationists have even led field trips at GSA for conference participants. Now, of course, objections are often raised against uh, creationist research of this kind. And one of the most common objections concerns the problem of bias. Some people say, how can you be a real scientist when you start with the Bible? Uh, if you're already committed to the Bible's account of origins, haven't you already surrendered your scientific objectivity? You've, you've already decided in advance what the answers are going to be? Well, I think that's a good question, and it's one that we do need to address. But I think we need to be aware that bias is not a uniquely creationist problem. Bias is a human problem. All of us come to the evidence with a worldview, with presuppositions that colour how we interpret the evidence. Consider, for example, the famous atheist Richard Dawkins. In his most famous book, The Blind Watchmaker, he said this, even if there were no actual evidence in favour of the Darwinian theory, there is, of course, he says, we should still be justified in preferring it over all rival theories. Now, why does Dawkins say this? Well, it's because he's committed to atheistic naturalism, the idea that matter is basically all that there is. And of course, if that's true, then Darwinian evolution, or at least something very like it, has to be true by default. So the truth is that all of us have our own biases, our own philosophical commitments, and that means that we all need strategies to help us control for our biases. The biggest problem arises when bias is not recognized, when we think that bias is a problem that only afflicts other people. All of us need all the time to be consciously and critically assessing our interpretations of the evidence, seeking input from those with different perspectives and making sure that our work is being subjected to rigorous peer review. Uh, that's the way to deal with bias. Another potential problem concerns the role of miracles. Um, some people are very quick to dismiss creationism because it invokes supernatural causes. Surely, they say, invoking miracles is simply a showstopper when it comes to doing science. Well, it's certainly true that creationism involves 
the miraculous, for example, the special creation of Adam and Eve or the different kinds of plants and animals. And it's also true that we can't study creation directly in the laboratory. A God can't be measured or detected by scientific means, and he doesn't perform miracles on demand. But none of that necessarily precludes creationism from being scientific, because scientific evidence can still point to a miraculous event having occurred. Consider a somewhat analogous example here. The miracle at the wedding in Cana in Galilee when Jesus turned water into wine. Imagine that you were a scientist and that you had been present there at the wedding. Uh, perhaps you were able to analyze what was in the jars immediately before and then immediately after the miracle had taken place. And perhaps from those observations, you'd concluded that something extraordinary must have happened, even if you didn't have direct access to the miracle itself. Or consider the resurrection of Jesus. Here we are at, at Easter weekend. And as Christians, we often argue, don't we, that the best explanation of the available evidence, the, the empty tomb, the, the transformation of the disciples and so on, is that a tremendous miracle took place. Now, of course, for creationism to be truly scientific, we do need to come up with specific claims that can be tested by scientific observation. Statements such as God exists or God made everything are too vague to be scientifically useful. But if we can formulate specific claims, for example, about the relationships of particular organisms or the origin of particular rock layers, well, then those are things that we can test scientifically. In fact, every time an anti-creationist offers a scientific argument against creationism, they're tacitly acknowledging that creationism does make scientific claims. For example, here's an article from a secular education journal in which the author compares a creationist interpretation of a particular hominin fossil with the evolutionary interpretation of that fossil. And of course, arguing that the evidence favors the evolutionary explanation. But notice that in order to test the creationist claim in this way, the creationist claim must be a scientific statement. Uh, you can't say, as some of our critics do, that creationism is untestable and therefore unscientific by definition, and then appeal to scientific evidence against creationism. Those two things are mutually exclusive. <clears throat> so as we um, seek as creationists to understand and interpret the scientific evidence, uh, what methodology should we adopt? Well, many creationists um, spend their time attacking evolution, trying to poke holes in evolutionary explanations. But there's a problem with that. Um, people tend to cling to even bad ideas unless they're offered a better alternative. So simply bashing evolution is unlikely in the long run to get us all that far. A better approach might be what we call the model building approach, where we seek to build our own scientific models, our own scientific theories, which are consistent with both the Bible and the scientific evidence. So what is a scientific model? Well, you can think of a scientific model as a conceptual framework that scientists use to explain the patterns that they observe in the natural world. A, a scientific model is a kind of story that tries to make sense of a whole range of data, showing how the various bits of data relate to one another and fit together into a coherent whole. The analogy is sometimes used of a forensic investigator trying to solve a crime. Uh, various bits of evidence can be collected at the crime scene, uh, a weapon, a speck of blood, a fingerprint. And provided that the evidence has been collected conscientiously and carefully, 
these are the bits of data that we can use to build a case. What we need, of course, is a story that connects all of the bits of data together and tries to make sense of them. And that's really what a good scientific model tries to do. It tries to explain a whole range of data within a single coherent framework. Um, Newton's th theory of gravity is a good example because <clears throat> it was able to explain both the motion of an apple falling from a tree, as well as the motion of the moon around the Earth. Another characteristic of a good scientific model is that it will enable us to make scientific predictions. In other words, predictions about future observations or experimental outcomes that we can then test by collecting more data or carrying out more experiments. And of course, models inevitably change as more data are collected. Uh, as we test our model, uh, we may need to modify our model. Perhaps we even need to throw our model out altogether. And building scientific models is vitally important in science because models provide the framework within which research is done. Models help to generate new questions and they help to guide our research, to steer our research in productive directions. So let's uh, consider a specific example of a scientific model that creationists have developed. And the example I want to look at concerns catastrophic plate tectonics, uh, sometimes called CPT for short. Now, CPT is a modification of the conventional theory known simply as plate tectonics. Uh, according to plate tectonics, the Earth's lithosphere, which is the Earth's crust plus the uppermost part of the Earth's mantle, is broken into a number of rigid plates which are moving relative to one another. Uh, in some places, such as along the San Andreas uh, fault system in Southern California, the plates are simply slipping past one another. In other places, such as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the plates are separating from one another, moving apart, and hot rock is welling up along the mid-ocean ridge to produce new ocean floor, uh, where the, the gap in between the two plates uh, is, is, uh, is separating. And then in still other places, uh, the plates are moving towards one another, and along what we call subduction zones, oceanic plates uh, dive beneath the adjacent continental plate and sink back into the Earth's interior. This is what's happening, for example, along the western margin of South America. Now, plate tectonics has proven to be a very successful theory. Uh, although it was first developed only 50 or 60 years ago, it's enabled scientists to explain an impressive range of geological data and to make many successful scientific predictions. Uh, for example, plate tectonics explains why the continents on either side of the Atlantic Ocean fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, uh, because those continents were once joined together, uh, but have become separated as the Atlantic Ocean basin opened up. Uh, plate tectonics also explains the distribution of earthquakes, volcanoes, and mountain chains the structure of the ocean floor, and many, many other things. However, from a young Earth perspective, there's a problem. Very precise measurements show that today, the Earth's plates are moving very slowly, at rates about the same as your fingernails grow. And at rates like that, it would have taken many tens of millions of years for, say, the Americas to separate from Europe and Africa as the Atlantic Ocean opened up. So back in the 1980s, um, one creationist, John Baumgardner, decided to investigate this problem for his doctoral studies in geophysics at UCLA. As part of his uh, research, he developed a supercomputer program that allowed him to model the dynamics of the Earth's interior in completely new ways. 
Now, he was aware that since at least the 1960s, experiments had shown that the rocks that make up the Earth's interior, the Earth's mantle, had the extraordinary ability to weaken by factors of billions or more under certain conditions of stress. And with his new computer simulation, Baumgartner was able to show that in certain situations, positive feedback processes could have resulted in thermal runaway of the Earth's mantle, with ocean plates subducting rapidly into the Earth's interior. <clears throat> the process would have worked something like this. As the ocean slab began to sink into the Earth's mantle along a subduction zone, the surrounding rocks would have undergone frictional heating. This heating would have caused those mantle rocks to weaken, and this weakening would have allowed the diving slab to dive still faster. As the slab um, velocity increased, more heat would have been generated, the mantle rocks would have weakened still further, and Baumgartner was able to show that uh, this could have led to this kind of thermal runaway, this positive feedback process where the Earth's plates could have been moving not at rates of a few centimetres per year, but at rates on the order of a metre per second. <clears throat> now, in the mid-1990s, uh, and building upon this pioneering research, a group of creationists, including John Baumgartner, proposed a brand new creationist version of plate tectonics, which they called catastrophic plate tectonics, or CPT. In the CPT model, the movement of the Earth's tectonic plates was a very rapid process that took place during the worldwide flood in the days of Noah. According to the model, uh, the flood began when the old pre-flood ocean floor began to catastrophically break away from the margins of the pre-flood continents and sink into the Earth's mantle. As it sank, it triggered an episode of thermal runaway, with the old ocean floor sinking rapidly into the Earth's interior, while hot rock welled up along the mid-ocean ridges to replace it. And because this new ocean floor was warmer and more thermally expanded than the old ocean floor, the ocean basins were uplifted, causing them to become shallower and displacing ocean water onto the continents. Sea level would have risen at least a kilometer over its pre-flood level, which combined with waves and earthquake generated tsunamis and so on, would have been sufficient to inundate the continents and to cover the tops of the highest pre-flood mountains. At the same time, the hot rock that was being emplaced along the mid-ocean ridges caused the ocean water to vaporise to steam, resulting in steam jets that propelled ocean water high into the atmosphere and resulting in an intense global rain, consistent with the Bible's description of the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep and the opening of the windows of heaven. However, the new seafloor that was being generated at the mid-ocean ridges was warmer and therefore less dense than the seafloor it was replacing. And so it had less of a tendency to sink back into the Earth's mantle. So eventually, as the old ocean floor was completely consumed, the process began to slow down and eventually the flood came to an end. And as the new seafloor so slowly cooled down, it subsided, and allowed the floodwaters to drain off the continents and back into the deepening ocean basins. So this is the catastrophic plate tectonics model. And one of the most exciting things, I think, about this creationist model is its explanatory and predictive power. A CPT not only provides us with a scientific model of how the flood could have happened, but it's also able to explain a wide range of geological data. In fact, it seems to explain all of the same data that conventional plate tectonics explains, the jigsaw fit of the continents and the distribution of volcanoes and earthquakes and so on. But it's also able to explain many other things that conventional plate tectonics doesn't explain, or at least doesn't explain well. Now, given our time constraints, I can't go through uh, lots of examples today, but I do want to give you just one. So let's 
uh, think about the depth and the temperature of subducted slabs. <clears throat> when he proposed his theory of thermal runaway, John Baumgartner predicted that the pre-flood ocean plates would have had sufficient energy to descend right the way through the Earth's mantle to the very top of the Earth's core. Now, this was in contrast to conventional plate tectonics, in which the plates, remember, moving much more slowly, would have lacked the energy to penetrate deeply into the Earth's mantle. Now, what's interesting is that with the development of seismic techniques that allow us to image the Earth's interior in unprecedented detail, we've discovered that there are large slabs of material, cooler than the rest of the Earth's mantle, sitting beneath the Earth's subduction zones and extending right down to the top of the core. These cold slabs seem to represent the remains of subducted ocean floor. And their presence in the Earth's mantle not only confirms that those sinking plates must have been moving faster in the past than today in order to explain the depth that they've penetrated into the mantle, but the fact that they're still cooler than the surrounding mantle, because that suggests that they must have plunged into the mantle uh, quite recently, otherwise they would have reached thermal equilibrium with the surrounding mantle rocks. So young Earth models um, like CPT, I think, have great utility in explaining a wide range of physical data and potentially at least uh, to be able to explain things better uh, in, in many ways than the conventional models. So what can we um, learn from all of this? Well, there are three things I, I just want to point out here. Firstly, we see that creationist model building is a positive approach to the data. Uh, too often, I think in the past, creationists have regarded the work of evolutionary scientists as hopelessly biased and unreliable. And, and while, of course, there may be some truth to that, and we do need to question evolutionary explanations. I think sometimes creationists have displayed a tendency to dismiss the data rather than to try to explain it. And the strength of the model building approach is that it focuses our minds on the need to explain the data. It forces us to see the data as something that we need to understand and explain rather than simply explain away. Secondly, um, I want you to notice how similar creationist models can sometimes be to conventional models. They often have many similar elements. Uh, CPT is a very good example. Uh, it has many elements in common with conventional plate tectonics. So it's simply not true to say, as some of our critics uh, claim, that creationists have to throw out 99% of modern science. In fact, very often it seems as though we're borrowing 99% of conventional science while modifying those scientific models in interesting ways. For example, playing around with the rates of processes, as we did with CPT, in order to see what happens. And often that produces some interesting results. Thirdly, <clears throat> notice how creationist models allow us to engage with new questions. There is a sense in which, as creationists, we aren't doing science any differently than our secular counterparts. Uh, our methods are much the same. We collect data, we propose hypotheses, we test them, we publish our conclusions after peer review. But what is different is that we're often asking different kinds of questions because our research is often motivated by questions that conventional evolutionary scientists wouldn't ask because they're operating within a different framework, a different worldview. And often asking new questions leads us to new discoveries. Now, I focus quite a bit on geology in this talk, and if we had more time, we could look at other examples of model building in the disciplines of biology or astronomy, 
Uh, for example, in biology, there are at least five major areas where creationists are developing new theories. Uh, in systematics, the science of classification, where creationists are developing new techniques for identifying and categorizing the created kinds. In the realm of design, where creationists are seeking to understand the patterns of biological similarity and difference that we observe. Uh, in natural evil, where creationists are thinking about how the introduction of death at the time of the fall affected the natural world. In speciation, where creationists are studying the mechanisms by which the created kinds diversified into new varieties and species. And in biogeography, where creationists are trying to explain the distribution of species across the Earth's surface. And if you want to read more about um, creationist model building in all of these areas and in others, um, a good place to begin might be um, my book, The New Creationism, Building Scientific Theories on a Biblical Foundation, which you can get from isgenesishistory.com in the U.S., or from ten of those dot com in in the UK, and in that book, I I sought to um, outline in in layman's terms much of this model building effort um, that creationists have been been uh, undertaking. And another resource which I'll mention here is is the podcast that I do with Dr. Todd Wood. Again, on our podcast, we often talk about creationist model building and about specific aspects of the creationist model, often with invited guests, uh, creation scientists and other scholars who come to talk to us about their work. And you can find us uh, on YouTube or on your favorite podcast streaming platform. Well, as I conclude, um, just a few take home messages um, from this talk. Um, firstly, I hope that you can see that building creationist models is more challenging than simply poking holes in evolution, but ultimately it's much more fruitful. Uh, model building focuses our minds on the need to do good science, to collect new data, to conduct new experiments, to come up with new theories and to make new predictions. And I hope that you've been encouraged to see that scientific models inspired by the Bible have shown real explanatory and predictive power. A, a word of caution, though, um, it, it would be a mistake, of course, to tie specific scientific models too closely to Scripture. Uh, our aim uh, should be to come up with models that are consistent with the Bible, but of course, our models are not demanded by the Bible. And it's important to remember this, because if it ever turns out that catastrophic plate tectonics or some other creationist theory is wrong, that won't invalidate the Bible or the Bible's account of the flood. It simply means that that particular model is incorrect and that we've got to think harder and to come up with a better model. Nevertheless, I think even if some of our models do turn out to be incorrect, and surely they will, um, science is richer for this kind of work being done. Because as creationists, we're asking questions, we're collecting data, we're making discoveries that nobody else is. And surely that's a good thing for science. Science is enriched as we ask new questions, as we gather new data, as we propose new ideas, even if not all of them stand the test of time. And then fourthly and finally, I think it's worth pointing out that the progress we have made is rather remarkable. I think especially given our lack of manpower and resources and time. Most of this creationist work has been done by a very small community of scientists who have access to almost no funding and within only the last few decades. And so that ought to be, a, I think, a great encouragement to us about what might be possible in the future. Of course, the progress that we have made does not mean that we've solved all the problems or that we've answered all the questions. Uh, in fact, our scientific research raises lots of questions. There are still plenty of unresolved problems. 
So there's still a big job to do. And there's definitely a role if you're a young scholar who would like to be involved. Well, I'll finish my talk there. Um, these are the contact details for Biblical Creation Trust if you'd like to get hold of me. And I'll hand back now and uh, hopefully we've got time for a few questions. Thank you, Paul. That was excellent. Uh, I think we have time for one quick question. So you've written this book, The New Creationism, uh, in 2009. The The title implies that there is an old creationism, uh, mm -hmm. and it's been a little bit. Uh, so, so how does the new creationism as of 2009 differ from the old creationism before? And is there a newer new creationism that's going on now that's different from uh, 15 years ago? Yes, I, I think the title um, was really to kind of contrast the model building approach that I was um, describing in that book compared to the, the 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 sort of creationism that often you see in sort of popular creationist circles, which is very much focused on critique of evolution. So this this I think this sort of focus on model building has always been there. It was there in the Genesis flood, you know, the seminal book that launched the creationist movement back in sixty one. Uh, Morris and Whitcomb there were were trying to propose a you know an overarching model of Earth history. So it's always been there, but I think it got overshadowed often by the focus on just attacking evolution. And so I think the new creationism is what I describe as this sort of model building approach as opposed to sort of just anti-evolutionism. And certainly, uh, you know, my you mentioned my book was published in 2009. A huge amount has, has happened since 2009. My book is well overdue for, for an update and a revision. And I, I keep it, it's on my list of things to do. I would love I would love to do a new edition um, because so much has, has happened. And there are definitely parts of the book that I would I would want to uh, sort of rewrite these days. And so I think that's part of the excitement of being involved in this new creationist project, that there is so much to do and so many new things to discover. Very cool. Creationism really is one of the more exciting uh, circles that, that I run in for, for that very reason. We've moved from reactionary to evolutionism to yeah. uh, positively doing science, uh, and in my case, more the, the theological side of things. So it's it's an exciting mm -hmm. thing. I'm uh, thrilled to be a part of it. I, I'm glad that you're doing the, the great work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here today. Okay, so this has been uh, Paul Garner a full-time researcher and lecturer for Biblical Creation Test, speaking for ISBH on creationism. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you.